short memory, Nehemiah 13. This morning, we're going to wrap up our series in Nehemiah. I don't know about you, but I have thoroughly enjoyed preaching through this book in a way I don't think I've really uh, ever felt before with another book. Uh, we've been at it for a while, but I, I really enjoyed it. We took a break for Palm Sunday and Easter, but in doing so, we, we kind of left things hanging a bit, right? right? We had all the people there doing their, you know, making a commitment and all the rest, and it's like maybe you wonder what happened, right? So we're going to come back today and conclude this great book. Uh, so please open your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 13, that's the last chapter. We'll be following the pattern of previous weeks in selecting uh, our high, certain, may, certain points along the way, high points from the text, and maybe not necessarily covering all the verses, so having it open might be helpful. I would be amiss not to tell you right up front that while we can, will conclude the preaching series in the final chapter of Nehemiah this morning, most of us are going to be disappointed with the book's ending. I'm just going to prepare you for that right now. It's a disappointing ending. Well, I would love to preach how, how wonderfully the long-lasting revival was, right? And how permanent the changes Nehemiah instituted were. The truth is, much of what Nehemiah accomplished shortly deteriorated following his return to service in the court of the king of Persia. If you remember, he was on loan from the king, right? Nehemiah actually spent 12 years in Jerusalem doing what he did in the chapters before that we read, and then he went back home for a little while. So in the same way that children get themselves into trouble when, when their parents are away, Nehemiah's return to Persia had the same effect on Jerusalem, and without his strong leadership and without his strong vision, unhealthy alliances and ungodly habits return and to threaten all that he had worked so hard to put in place. Nevertheless, Despite Israel's backsliding, it doesn't negate the revival itself, nor the principles that, that were integral to, to, to its beginning and its start, nor does it negate the things that we have learned about over the past three months, the incredible things that Nehemiah did and accomplished through God's Spirit. Uh, they remain, all of that remains relevant to us today despite Israel's failure to apply it. So you know, we need to keep that in the, in the back of our minds here. In our last message, we left off in chapter 10 with the people demanding a covenant to be put in writing, right? Remember? They wanted the priests and the leaders and everybody, to, the family heads, to sign this document. The covenant concerned the, the entire community making an oath together to obediently return to following the Sinai covenant or what we also hear um, labeled as the law of Moses. So, same thing. As we will soon see, it is these very same stipulations that this renewal covenant of chapter 10 concerned itself with that Nehemiah now finds in complete disarray upon its return. Before we open chapter 13, let us just quickly sum up uh, chapters 11 and 12 so that we feel like we've completed the book. Prior to the return of the king, Nehemiah saw to the repopulation of Jerusalem, so they cast lots and people moved back into town. Likely they rebuilt some of the demolished houses and all that. During this time, Nehemiah put in place the Levites, the musicians, the gatekeepers, and all the personnel necessary to the regular functioning of the temple. Systems of tithing and collecting food allotments and necessities for the regular serving at the temple had all been reestablished. All that had been reestablished. Chapter 12 covers a list of priests and Levites that served at that time and then moves on to describe the elaborate celebration of the dedication of the walls of Jerusalem. So there was this huge celebration to dedicate all the work that had been done. And the people not only dedicated the re rebuilt walls and gates to the Lord, they also rede rededicated the city and themselves to the service of the Lord. For Nehemiah, I imagine it was a high point, this, this great celebration, this dedication. Um, at this point, he could see all that had been accomplished in the Lord. I would think that that would have given him a real sense of self-satisfaction, that God had used him to do something great and mighty, and he did, and he did. And the failure of, of Israel to continue in that is not on Nehemiah or the Lord, is it, Right? This section ends with this wonderful description in Nehemiah 12, 43. And they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced. For God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced. And the joy of Jerusalem could be heard from far away. From far away. Right? 
Surely an idyllic ending, right? If we could just stop there, it would be great. We could almost hear the music come up and the, and the credits roll in the background as Nehemiah rides off into the sunset, his job now finished, completed. It would be great. Wonderful end to a wonderful story. But that is simply not what happened. Chapter 12 ends with Nehemiah's reporting uh, of men that he had put in place. He appointed them over the storerooms of the temple. These rooms were for the storage of contributions and first fruit offerings and tithes of the people's worship. They were to be stored there. These rooms were dedicated to the storage of contributions that were des designated for the support of the priests, the Levites, the musicians, the gatekeepers, and all the people that were necessary to the functioning of the worship life of the temple. This was absolutely necessary to support the, the, the livelihood of the temple so that there could be worship in, in, in Jerusalem. It would appear as Nehemiah returned to his post as cupbearer, the walls as well as the worship life of Jerusalem had been successfully rebuilt. Job well done. And the city as well as the people were now well on their way to recovery and a promising future in the Lord. I mean, the sun is shining. Everything is looking bright. But as we will soon discover, chapter 13, there's a, there's, a, there's a cloud on the horizon, and this will not be the case. That's the title of the message this morning, A Short Memory. I must say, though, I, I knew this was the ending of the book of Nehemiah from previous reading, right? I mean, I knew this, but it was, it was just disappointing this time after this journey we've, we've taken together in this wonderful book, if it could be one of those things you could, you know, one of those software things you could change the ending, I would, I would have changed the ending, you know. I find myself grieving with Nehemiah and with the Lord as, as the people so quickly turn back from him and back to their rebellious ways. It's unbelievable. I struggled this week with how to present today's message sort of in a positive light, right? I don't want it to be a bummer. I struggled to come up with a title for the message as well. I considered a, a sad ending to a great story. That was one of my titles. Certainly reasonable, uh, considering things, but, but it wouldn't have been exactly true. It really wouldn't have been true. Because one day, there will be a glorious ending to this sad story. Not because, you, not because we, not because humanity will ever change, but because Jesus paid the price to alter our destiny. Amen? That's, that's the... That will be the reason the story will have a good ending. I thought about entitling, entitling the message Groundhog Day after 19, that 19, 1996 movie with Bill Murray. I don't know if you're all familiar with that. It's kind of a dumb movie, honestly, but, but it was an apt metaphor for Israel's relationship with God. From the Exodus to the close of the Old Testament, it depicts well Israel's covenant-breaking conduct, their, their short memory. Conduct, they repeat, over and over and over again to their own painful consequence. Painful, painful consequence. Once Nehemiah was out of sight and out of mind, the priests and the nobles, and eventually the people, so the leadership went first, right? Eventually the people returned again to the very practices that brought God's judgment upon Jerusalem in the first place. Again, short memory. 140 years earlier, this place had been wiped out because God's blessing was removed, and now they are practicing the very things that brought that to bear upon them. The revival in Nehemiah's day began with the reading of God's Word. Do you remember that? In chapter 8, this is what kicked it off. And the people wanting, they actually wanted to apply what they've heard. They hadn't heard this. This was new to them, and they wanted to apply it. And this is a sound recipe for any of us, for growth for any of us, if we'll just take the time to read God's Word and let it take root deep in our hearts and our souls, and then apply it as best we can, as best we can, it will be transformational to our lives, transformational to bringing revival into our own hearts, guaranteed, absolutely guaranteed. We should learn that from the lesson of this book. That is, that's a guarantee. Verse 1 through 3 of chapter 13, I think sort of act as a hinge to connect us to not only what occurred in the past, but also what is about to take place as Nehemiah now returns to Jerusalem. Verse 1, on that day the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people. And this is likely referring to the reading of the law that we, that we saw them do in chapter 8 and 9. There it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God. 
and this will become more relevant as we continue. Why were the Ammonites and Moabites banned from the assembly of Israel? Verse 2, they were banned because they had not met the Israelites with food and water on the way into the promised land, but hired Balaam to call a curse down upon them. The entire sordid affair, including the seduction of Israelite men into sexual idolatry, is recorded in Numbers chapter 21 through 25. There's, there's so much more to the story going all the way back to Genesis 19 and Abraham's nephew Lot and his daughters, but, but we don't have time for all that to, this morning. But there's a, there's a lot more to the story. Suffice to say, the reason the Amorites and the Moabites were not to be admitted into the assembly of Israel had to do with their idolatrous practices, their hatred of Israel, and their intent to curse rather than bless God's people. That's why verse 3 reminds us that upon hearing the law read, the people excluded all who were of foreign descent from among themselves, including the Amorites and the Moabites. And then they committed to refrain from the practice of giving their daughters in marriage or allowing their sons to take wives from the pagan nations around them, right? This is, this is all back to chapter 9 and 10. This is all the things that they agreed upon. Verse 3 clearly harkens back to that covenant vow and serves to remind us that Judah, as a people, had entered into a renewed vow and covenant before the Lord. Again, all these, all these, these first three verses, they act as a hinge to connect us to what has already occurred in the past, but also to what is about to take place now in chapter 13 as Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem. In verse 4 and 5, we begin to realize why Nehemiah is giving us this reminder. While we've taken a couple weeks off, right, Palm Sunday and Easter, and we're back at it, Nehemiah has has been away now from Jerusalem for a number of years. We we really don't know how many, but he he ended his thing, he went back to the king, and now he's he's revisiting. But we don't really know the time block in between there. Um, Verse 4, before this, meaning prior to Nehemiah's return to Jerusalem, Eliashabib, the priest, was put in charge of the storms of the temple. Nehemiah informs us that Eliashib who is the high priest, was closely associated with Tobiah. And verse 5, had provided him with large quarters in the temple. And this is key. Formerly used to store the grain offerings, the incense, and other temple articles used for worship at the temple. Formerly used to store the tithes of grain, the new wine and the olive oil, and all the things collected and set aside for the support of the Levites, the musicians, the gatekeepers, and the priests and their families, and, the, and, and for the worship of God. All these things are no longer here because Tobiah has an apartment in the temple. This was a big deal, big deal for a number of reasons. First, do you recall who Tobiah was? Wasn't Tobiah the one that stirred up the nations and Jerusalem in an attempt to stop the rebuilding of the wall? Wasn't it Tobiah that ridiculed God as well as Nehemiah for their attempt at rebuilding? Wasn't it Tobiah and his buddies, Sanballat and Gershom, that threatened to send false reports to the king that Nehemiah was about to declare himself king over Jerusalem? Wasn't it Tobiah and his buddies that threatened the people of Jerusalem with attack and murder? This is the same Tobiah. Why in the world would Eliashib even consider allowing this man into Jerusalem, never mind giving him access to a a living space in the temple and these rooms that were used to store tithes and equipment needed for worship? What in the world was this guy thinking? Rather than protect the integrity of the temple, his actions defiled it completely. And now the answer lies in the short-ending phrase of, of of verse 4 that suggests that Eliashib was closely associated with Tobiah. The word here used to describe this association was most often used of people related by blood or marriage. The latter is most likely in view. So in direct opposition to the Word of God, Tobiah had been allowed to marry into the high priest's family. And, and And Eliashib had a son-in-law or a brother-in-law type of relationship or responsibility now to Tobiah. This doesn't excuse this outrage. It simply strengthens the reason God gave the prohibition against foreign marital relationships in the first place. 
that this intermixing of ethnic ties would lead to sin and rebellion against God and the purposes for the nation of Israel. I know in today's culture this would be like way out there, right? You know, but this was a prohibition the Lord gave and for a reason. And it certainly did occur, right? This, this did, because Israel went against this and was disobedient, if there's one single sin that was most responsible for the nation's downfall, time after time after time, it was intermarriage with the pagan nations around them and the enticement it wielded towards the worship of other gods, the idolatry, the greatest sin of, the, of Israel in the Bible, our greatest sin as well. Skipping down to verse 23 through 31, we read, Moreover, in those days I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and, and Moab. So we're rolling Ashdod in there now. These are the ancient Philistines. These are the people that we would have uh, heard in the, in, the, in the Old Testament as the Philistines, always another enemy against Israel, people that were involved again in trying to prevent the, the, the building of the wall. So now they're, they're, they're intermarrying all in, in, in this. And half of their children, Nehemiah reports, spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of other peoples. And they didn't know how to speak the language of Judah. I rebuked them and called curses down upon them. Remember, when they got back from captivity, they, most of the people lost the ability to speak and read their own language. The Word of God couldn't even be read by these people that's why they didn't know it, because they lost their own language, and here they are doing this again. I beat some of them, Nehemiah reports, and I pulled out their hair. I made them take an oath in God's name and said, you are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. Wasn't it, was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sent? Among the many nations, there was no king like him. He was loved by God, and God made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign women. Must we hear now that you two are doing all this terrible wickedness and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women? Obviously, strong response when Nehemiah is in. Not, you know, the whole hair-pulling thing and stuff, not something we practice in the church today, Right? But when we consider, and this is serious, right? But when we consider the, uh, the terrible cost of Israel's failings and the death and destruction of millions of people that it brought upon the nation, right? The entire nation. Perhaps we can at least understand, right? Maybe we don't agree, but we can understand the intensity of Nehemiah's response. This is a big deal. This is why the people were judged in the first place. And here they are back at it again. His mention of Solomon, right, was to remind us that even Solomon, who was considered one of Israel's greatest kings, he fell in this area. Despite the gift of wisdom, right, remember Solomon asked God to give him wisdom and God gave him wisdom. He didn't practice it in this one area. His disobedience not only created a costly blind spot in his own life, but it set up a future culture of disobedience that many kings followed uh, in Israel followed after to their own demise as well. It actually, it set up a sinful practice when Solomon did this. Solomon brought this into God's house, we could say it that way. In verse 28, Nehemiah gives us insight into how this practice has helped to bring about now this present spiritual decline that he's witnessing coming back to, to Jerusalem. While it was inferred in verse 4 that Eliashib and Tobiah were related through intermarriage, and again, they used a word that is most likely used that way, verse 28 makes it absolutely crystal clear here that Eliashib was related to Sanballat by intermarriage through his son Joida, right? Do you remember who Sanballat was, right? He's Nehemiah's buddy and causing all this stuff, right? And so the high priest has marital relationships with both uh, families from Tobiah and, and Sanballat. And so, Nehemiah, I love, I love, I love this guy. I mean, some things, maybe he makes some mistakes here along the way, but, but he just drives this guy right out. Drives the high priest's son out. He's not interested in being politically correct. This guy's got to go. He's the governor. He's out of here. And he prevents him from having any further influence at the temple. Remember them, Nehemiah prays, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood of the Levites. All right? So, uh, strong stuff. 
In this way, verse 30 records, Nehemiah purified the priesthood and the Levites of everything foreign, and he assigned them again, he reassigned them again, separate duties and tasks. He also made provision for contributions of wood for the fires and for the first fruits to be tithed. So, so Nehemiah is putting everything back in place now that was in place before he left. Verse 31 records one of several prayers in the chapter where Nehemiah prays to be remembered. God, remember me for these things. And certainly, I think as we gather here this morning to read this account almost 2,500 years later, we know he was remembered for his dedication and his service. God approved of what Nehemiah did. God honored his prayer, and that's why we're even having this discussion this morning. Going back to verse 8, we discover, how did Nehemiah deal with the Tobiah apartment situation? What did Nehemiah do in verse 8? It tells us that Nehemiah was greatly displeased, greatly displeased. Which, that's Hebrew for he was really, really angry and upset, right? Upon hearing this report, he went directly to the temple and had all of Tobiah's stuff tossed out of these rooms, right? I imagine Nehemiah doing that with a certain lack of concern for Tobiah's breakables, you know what I'm saying? No. Likely there was little constraint here uh, on the order of how this was all accomplished. But the bottom line is Tobias' things were tossed to the curb, and that was that. That was that. Afterwards, verse 9, Nehemiah gave orders to have the rooms fumigated and purified. And then he put the equipment for worship back where it belonged. And he had the rooms restocked with grain offerings and incense. We might wonder why, why Nehemiah was so upset over the situation with Tobias. There's a little space in the temple, right? Sure, Tobiah was an enemy and had, had caused Nehemiah a great deal of trouble during the wall building. He had even threatened him personally and attempted to lure him out, you remember, into a trap on the plains of Ono. Come on out and have lunch, and when you come away from those walls, we'll, we'll do you harm. Uh, was Nehemiah dishonored and disrespected? No doubt. Had he been stabbed in the back by the high priest? Clearly he had. But ultimately, as we saw in chapter 1, Nehemiah's grief and passion is for the condition of God's house and God's name. That's what really is driving this man. His grief and passion is not rooted in himself, but it's in God's city, God's people, and ultimately in God himself. There's a lot to learn here, actually, concerning that. Um, if it were you or I, we'd, we'd likely feel betrayed and even victimized and act out of self-preservation, right? Who would blame us? Our grief and passion would likely be wrapped up a bit more in ourselves. But here's where Nehemiah demonstrates, I think, a, a level of godliness and maturity and passion for God and God's house and His name uh, that we should, we should only wish to emulate. It's not just about Tobiah using the temple as his personal apartment and storage unit whenever he came to Jerusalem, right? As despicable as that was, Nehemiah's passion and grief was also tied up in why the storage rooms were empty in the first place. Why, why was there a space for Tobiah to move in? Why, why were these rooms empty in the first place? We don't know the whole story to that. What happened to the people's oath? That they would no longer neglect the house of God. They actually called a curse down upon themselves, remember, right? If they broke this oath, what happened to all that? Why wasn't the room filled with fruits of tithes and offerings? Perhaps we think, again, Nehemiah was a bit too strong in his approach here. Where was the love of God in that, right? Poor, poor Tobiah. What kind of witness was that for poor Tobiah to see, right? We often feel that a pastor or a church leader who demonstrates any type of righteous anger is wrong in doing so. But who else? Let me ask you this. Who else do we see in, in Scripture doing the same sort of thing? Didn't Jesus go into the temple? Didn't Jesus fling stuff around? Wasn't Jesus angry? Didn't he drive out the money changers and those selling animals with a whip? That wasn't too Christ-like, right, as we would think today, right? And why did he do it? Wasn't it because he was zealous for his father's house? His father's house was to be a house of prayer, not a commercial market space, right? It grieved him. It grieved Jesus deeply to see the temple being used in this way. We talked about this just last week in the Easter message, right? Jesus regularly confronted the Pharisees and the scribes of his day with very strong language. He was a confrontational man. He was not timid. Sometimes demonstrating a little passion, I think, is actually a very godly thing. 
Clearly, the empty room was for Nehemiah a glaring sign of a deeper spiritual decay and disobedience that was occurring in Jerusalem. Now, perhaps we should personalize this a bit and ask ourselves, what do we have stored in our hearts? What about our store, the storage unit of our heart, the temple of our heart? What things or relationships have we allowed to come between us and, and God's worship? What are some of the things that we maybe need to be more passionate about removing from the temple and kicking to the curb out of our hearts, right? And then as Nehemiah did, maybe we need to purify ourselves and put back some of the ties and items of worship we have allowed other things to take priority, priority over in our lives. I'd like to remind you again of a spiritual principle I, I gave you a few weeks back that I, I believe personally is key to applying the Old Testament passages to New Testament realities in our lives today. Perhaps you recall the principle, it's not always applicable to everything, but I think it's very helpful to apply it when it is. It goes like this. What we see physically occurring in the Old Testament, we often find its spiritual counterpart in New Testament teaching. So what, what physically occurs in the Old Testament often spiritually occurs in the New Testament and in, in our New Testament Christian lives. There's literally tons of examples I could give. In chapter 2, when Nehemiah first arrived in the area, we were told in verse 10, when Sanbal, and Hornite, and Sanbal the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Perhaps you had not realized this, but Tobiah was an Ammonite. And Sanbal the Horonite is thought to have come from the city of Horonain in Moab. Isn't that interesting? Could it be this is why Nehemiah opened the chapter by reminding us of the prohibition against Ammonites and Moabites? And yet the leaders in Israel are, are, are into marrying with these guys? In the Old Testament, God prohibited these particular people groups from having fellowship with or even being part of the assembly of God's people. But where the Old Testament prohibition was a physical or an ethnic prohibition against uh, the particular ethnic groups, right? Today, it's no longer a prohibition of physical or ethnicity, but of spiritual and cultural prohibition, okay? So this is where we make the connection to that principle. We are to refrain from being in intimate relationship and fellowship with unbelievers who live godless lives. That's why membership in our church requires that you agree to the statement of, of, of our faith, statement of faith that we believe. Otherwise, we would find ourselves yoked to unbelievers who share opposing loyalties and beliefs. And this is not being closed-minded or bigoted or any of that stuff. It's just practical. It's just practical. Ephesians 5, for instance, describes a number of immoral activities that many unbelievers today engage in regularly. Paul warns us in, in verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes upon those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Now, again, it's, it's important to make the point here, we're not talking about going somewhere and, you know, living in a monastery, right, so that we have no connection with people of the world. This is more about being careful about those relationships and what they can do to move, take us away from, from where God wants us to be. It's because of these very things that are practiced in the world today that God's judgment and wrath is coming upon this earth. Paul goes on to say, for you were once darkness, right? We were once, all of us, we were once darkness, but now we're light. Live as children of light. And verse 11, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. So today there is a spiritual but not ethnic prohibition concerning the people of the world. But the principle and the purpose is exactly the same as it was in the Old Testament, to keep the witness of God's people pure and undefiled from the corruptible things of this world. So that's the principle, right? See it there, see it here, same thing. 2 Corinthians 6, Paul adds a few more helpful comments to make the point when he writes, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? 
What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Paul is making the point that New Testament Christians must be discerning concerning the relationships they form with the people of the world. Scripture affirms in multiple places we are to live in the world, right, but not be of the world. And again, I want to be really careful here. Cults, lots of cults preach this kind of message and draw people away from their families and all kinds of stuff. That's not what this is about. This is about a spiritual principle that we need to learn to be discerning because there are people that will come into our lives that are not good for us spiritually. I heard someone say the other day, you can't help who you love. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can choose to love God in the first place and obey God. And, and you, we do have control over our emotions. We can decide who we want in our life, who's good for us or not good for us. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, Paul says. And this, this, this now connects the, the dots, I think, and clarifies the New Testament understanding of the temple as well. And then quoting from Isaiah 52, 11 and Ezekiel 20, 34 through 41, Paul says, therefore, come out from among them. Come out and be separate. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. Again, this is Paul quoting from the Old Testament in the New, so, so the principle is not an, no longer just an Old Testament principle, it's now moved here into the New Testament and our faith and the Bible, the New Testament, uh, and we, we need to figure out how do we live this out here today, right? Again, very important to keep uh, the principle that I said that we're exploring right up front, what we see physically occurring in the Old Testament, we often find its spiritual counterpoint in the New Testament teaching. Clearly, this principle of who we are yoked together with in this world has huge relevancy, right? For marriages, for business partnerships, and even for the close friends that we might choose. It's not that we're any better than anybody else. If anything, our understanding of grace and what Christ has done for us, should, we should be the first ones to say we're worthless and we were, we were darkness, we're, we're no good. Everything we are that is good now today is because of Christ. So we don't, we don't claim to be better than anybody else. The principle is really just about being obedient to God's guidance and allowing God to protect us and keep us from being lured away from Him and out into the world. What agreement, again, is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, right? And idolatry is not just an Old Testament problem, right? Everybody agree with that? Idolatry is a huge New Testament problem, and we need to be aware of that and think about that. Paul's comment in verse 16 reminds us that we are the temple of the living God, and it has great relevancy to not only this passage, but principles that all the principles we've been discussing. Clearly what has happened here is Tobiah has wormed his way into the assembly of God's people where he does not belong. He doesn't have the right heart for this. And he, an Ammonite, an enemy of Israel, has been given a room within the walls of the temple in the area where only the priests and the Levites should ever be allowed. This is the enemy's game in our lives. He wants to insert compromise into our faith. He wants, to offer, he wants us to offer Tobiah a room in our house as well, a room in our temple. He wants us to invite Tobiah into our lives to pull us away from him and distract us from, from worship and living in obedience to his word. See, Tobiah represents people in our lives that are opposed to the gospel. And people... And, and our being an intimate relationship to people who are opposed to the gospel, um, it, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not only a, a bad idea, but as the New Testament warns us, we're to have nothing to do with the works of darkness. We're to avoid being unequally yoked with unbelievers. Verse 7, Nehemiah labels what Eliashib did as an evil thing. As a high priest, his responsibility is what? To God and to the people of God first, but clearly, Eliashib chose a different path. The, and this principle is alive and well today in many liberal churches that no longer uh, preach the gospel or, or think highly of Scripture, where biblical principles have been tossed to the wind in favor of, uh, uh, really, uh, marriage to an unbiblical cultural norms of today. That's what's happened. Devastating consequences to the church. 
Verse 10 through 13, I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. Can you imagine that? There's no longer really a priesthood or a temple worship anymore. They've all had to go back to their fields because there's no support. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Remember that? That was what they said. We won't neglect the house of God. Why are you uh, neglecting the house of God near my house? Why is, why is the house of God being neglected? Then I called them together and I stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil into the storms. I put Shelemiah, the priest, Zadok, the scribe, and a Levite named Padiah in charge of the storms and made Hanan, son of Zuchar, the son of Mataniah, their assistant, because they were considered trustworthy. So Nehemiah replaced the leadership and, and put people that were trustworthy in place. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. All, why is all this going? To get us back to being able to, to have church, right? <laughs> to, to, to get some kind of worship life back in Israel. So Nehemiah returns after years away and he finds the house of God neglected. This entire system of tithing and worship is completely broken down. And not only does he throw Tobiah out, but he drives the son of the high priest away as well, right? He cleans that up, cleansing the temple in Jerusalem from this foreign and ungodly influence. He's come in and he's, he's, he's like, wiped the slate clean here. Nehemiah raises up trustworthy, godly men to reinstitute the worship life of Jerusalem and the people begin to respond again. We don't know exactly how long Nehemiah was gone, but it was long enough for things to completely break down. It was long enough that people began to intermarry again and have children, right? Because they you heard him speaking in the other language. These are children. So he's long enough for people to, to intermarry and to have children uh, with the nations around them. It makes the point, I think, of how necessary strong leadership is, right? We, we know this from our country standpoint. We know this from other things. When there's not strong leadership, there's, there's chaos and craziness. It makes the point of how necessary it is. And here we have a case in point. The, absent, the absence of Nehemiah's strong leadership quickly brought a complete reversal to almost everything that he had put in place because the leaders that were left behind were not good leaders. It says a lot again for how important strong leadership is strong godly leadership is. The pastor's job is, is not always pretty, and difficulty often comes when the need to confront sin arises in the lives of professing believers. Today, people usually just head on down the, the block to another church rather than kind of deal with the mess, but, but that wasn't an option back in the days of Nehemiah. That wasn't an option. There was no other temple to go to. There was no other place you could be. So Nehemiah returns, and he's forced to confront the neglect of the temple, the return to intermarriage, and pagan influence, but then he also discovers the Sabbath is not being kept. If you recall from the previous message, uh, these three things were the, were the very things, again, included in the covenant of chapter 9 and 10. We talked about this a few weeks ago, but the Sabbath was a sign of the covenant, it was a testimony to the pagan nations around them of God's care and love for Israel. Their keeping of the Sabbath was important. Breaking any of these oaths was serious, but breaking the Sabbath, which was the sign of their very covenant with God, was all the more so. Verse 15 through 22, we don't have time to read all this, but Nehemiah describes not only seeing firsthand how broad the breaking of the Sabbath was, but he was forced to confront the people, the nobles, and the foreign merchants from trading on the Sabbath. He had to confront everybody. Everybody was doing this. Using his powers as governor, Nehemiah locked the gates to the city, and he threatened the merchants with arrest if they continued to come to Jerusalem on the Sabbath. He told them, if you continue to sleep out here, I will lay hands on you. And that's kind of a funny joke, right? We don't think that he meant pray, right? Clearly, the nobles and those profiting from the Sabbath, they would not have been happy with Nehemiah's doing so. Nehemiah's like flipping everything up and down. These are the people who had the power, had the money. They're not going to be happy with, with what Nehemiah's doing. Nevertheless, he doesn't care. Again, I like this guy. He doesn't care. He locks the gates, and he brought compliance once again, asking God to remember him for his zeal, for, for his actions. Now, we don't have time to fully explore this, 
uh, today. I'd like to come back to this another time. But there's much that we are losing out as a people in our 24-7 world that God wants us to receive. And having a Sabbath day off, whether, you know, in, in their day it was Saturday, you know, or Sunday, but having one day to worship God and not work and all that, that's actually a pretty good thing. That's a pretty good thing. In our internet world, we have 24-7. Our merchants are outside our gates 24-7, right? They're always out there. All you got to do is go, Amazon, you know, you're ready to roll. Print one click and you can buy it. It's on us. It's on us, right, to figure out how to bring balance and discipline around this and honor God in it. We're called to be a different people than everybody else around us. See, that has a, that's one of those principles that ships from the, from the Old Testament to the New as well. We're called to be God's people and set aside and different than how the rest of the world lives. While the Sabbath is not a sign particularly of a covenant for us, it's not, right? We're not under that law. God longs to have us enter into His rest and to take a break in Him. Again, it would be a great subject to explore together in another series. While the book of Nehemiah ends without clear resolution, the book of, of Malachi closes the gap for us. Malachi was written some 20, 30 years after Nehemiah's second visit. Obviously, Nehemiah, again, was on loan from the king of Persia, and at some point he had to leave Jerusalem and trust that, that he had done all he could to complete the work God brought him to do. The first time and again the second time. Each time he left, he left with these things in place. He did all that God brought him to do. Chapter 1 in Malachi informs us things have gone downhill again. You know, only 20 years later as uh, Malachi is confronting Judah over the practice of sacrificing crippled animals and cheating the Lord. Clearly, the neglecting of God's house remained an issue. The 400 years of silence that we talked about a, a few weeks ago, following Malachi's book, the closing of the Old Testament, speaks volumes also concerning the broken covenant and relationship that God had with Israel in the Old Testament. Yet it's hopeless as all that seems, and it seems pretty hopeless. Nehemiah served God and the people of his day well. He did, right? No one, no one could make an argument that he didn't. We must strive to do the same. Whether God has growth in mind for us as a church or preserving a remnant through the difficult times that are likely coming, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But again, the, the principles, the inspiration, and all we have learned over the past eight to ten weeks has not been in vain. It has not been in vain. Israel's failure is not ours. For God's Word never returns void and without completing the goal of His sending it. Again, I thoroughly enjoyed um, our journey together through this wonderful book. I really did. And I'm kind of sad that it's over. We've got to <laughs> move on to some other stuff. But... Um, to me, it's been a great journey. I hope you have felt the same. Let's pray.